Now I have the pleasure of introducing Jeffrey Stutzman, who has over 25 years of intelligence experience, uh, commercial and government information security experience, and management level experience with such organizations as the Department of Defense, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University, Northrop Grumman, Cisco Systems, and earlier just spent six years, as John had mentioned, with US Navy as an intelligent officer. Uh, intelligence officer, very intelligent, of course. Um, he is the founder of Boston area company WAPAC Labs and recently founded Trusted Internet LLC, which he now heads. Trusted Internet is a managed security services and managed detection and response company, which takes, <coughs> excuse me, which takes large enterprise company security practices and uses them to protect small companies at a reasonable price. Uh, the timing just happens to be absolutely perfect with regards to what's going on right now in the celebrity, celebrity law firm uh, case that's going on down in the United States. Uh, and Jeff absolutely has experience with ransomware, uh, which he will talk about shortly. And uh, as John had mentioned, we've got a live Q&A shortly thereafter. So by all means, get your questions ready. Jeff, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to go off video to be able to conserve bandwidth down here so I don't have a choppy feed. And um, go ahead and share my screen. And there we go. We good? Okay. So four days. Um, four days is the name of this, this presentation, and you're going to see why. As a CEO, uh, you're gonna understand that time delays when you're making decisions can really be impactful to a lot of different, a lot of different things. But uh, so why is four days important? You'll, you'll, you'll see. So as Arston mentioned, this is me. I don't spend a lot of time talking about myself. You can go to my LinkedIn and check it out. It's all up to date. Uh, but the, the bottom line is I run a company that's focused on small and medium sized businesses but my background is all in environments with 100,000 computers or bigger. <clears throat> so today <clears throat> I run, I typically, uh, when we go and do an engagement, we step in as the company's chief information security officer and we operate from that level. Uh, background, you heard a little bit about that, so I'm not gonna go through that, but, uh, but feel free to go look me up, LinkedIn, it's at the bottom of the page. Just a little bit about some of the things that we do. We, we focus on cybersecurity, but we have services available in a whole bunch of other different areas. Uh, right now, we've got, a, we've got a partner that we're working through that's delivering masks and medical pods, uh, external medical pods. We, we had a 757 land in Honduras to be able to bring people back to the States. So we've got a lot of capability, although my area focuses specifically in cyber. So about 18 months ago, um, I was at a restaurant in New Hampshire, where I live, having dinner with my wife, two Manhattans into the night, and I get a phone call. And, uh, and they said, Jeff, how fast can you be in Houston? And I said, well, what's going on? And they said, well, there's a three and a half billion dollar company down there. And their IT has been down for four days. Don't really know why, but they've, tra they've stopped trading on the NASDAQ. Uh, we think you're gonna go talk to the board. So I need you to go down, figure out what's going on, be the liaison between the CIO and the CEO, and then represent as their chief information security officer for their board. About, uh, about 7.30 the following morning, I was, I was on site in Houston. And what I found out is that four days earlier, they had seen an anomaly that popped up almost at the same time in Yemen and Singapore, two different data centers. And within two hours, over a thousand servers had been encrypted, completely locked up. And so the, the company literally had no ability to communicate. They really didn't have an effective backup uh, or disaster recovery plan, they had one, but it was encrypted. And the company was, for the most part, dead in the water. 
and trying to figure out which ways to go. So backup systems were encrypted. The data was encrypted. They had no communications. They had no out of band communications. They have about 65 locations around the world, about 7,500 employees. They really had no understanding of what the true extent of the damage was. Uh, they were bleeding cash at about, the, about a rate of about $25 million a day. And the company now four days in was facing an extinction event and had pretty much run out of hope. When I sat with the CEO, I, you could see the desperation in his face and I didn't know to what extent it went. But I sat with the CEO, I sat with the chief security officer. The CIO's daughter was getting ready to graduate from college, so we sent him north. And I took over basically as the CIO, incident response command, which is what I normally would do. We step in with that security mindset and just kind of take over. Uh, and what we found out uh, was that, and this is after communicating with the, uh, with the folks that had the, the ransomware embedded in these systems is, they wanted $700,000 and it's after hours. And it was actually a little bit more than $700,000. We were able to negotiate them back a little bit. But the challenge that we had was we're 40 days into an event. Usually if you get ransomed, you get about 72 hours to be able to respond before the key gets automatically wiped out. But because we believe that this was a targeted event, uh, they were a little bit more lenient. And it, and it was a pretty sizable number. It was the third largest payout in, in American history at the time. And so we ended up having to pull a wire out of the bank after hours. Uh, we had to find an exchange that would convert $700,000 into Bitcoin. And then we had to trust that we were going to put the Bitcoin into the internet and that somebody on the other end was going to pay or was going to give us the, the, the decryption key. So this is what a $100,000 Bitcoin transaction looks like. And so you can imagine I'm sitting in an office with, with uh, the CEO and the chief security officer. I'm sitting behind a desk and from the waist up, I've got the game face on. From the waist down, not so much. Uh, so we, we were, this was transaction three of six. We did seven of them that night. Our first transaction was just one Bitcoin to test. And then the last one, we did it every half hour uh, because it took a half an hour to get the transaction complete. And for them to be able to put it into what they called a mixer, meaning it's gonna become non-traceable very quickly. Uh, so we had to just believe that in the end, we were gonna get a decryption key and we were just gonna to have to go through this at $700,000 versus 25 million a day for four days. Um, the payoff is, is significant. So here's, here's the way it went. Um, day one, the IT team figured out very quickly that they were unable to, to contain the damage. In fact, uh, a lot of the servers were virtualized just like many of yours. They actually turned off the virtualization. The code turned it back on so that they could go in and finish the, uh, the encryption. It was turned off again and the code turned it back on. Or, and so it was just constant back and forth, all of the data centers around the world. So the IT team was unable to take care of it. Day two, they really had no understanding of what the damage was. The attack vector was unknown. They didn't even know what was going on. They hadn't really received a, a ransom note at that point because everything was encrypted. On day three, they brought in CrowdStrike, which was unable to, to recognize the malware. And I'll talk about why in just a second. Uh, by day four, we were, we were brought in on day four. Um, we notified the board. I counseled the company on how to work with the FBI. And we could talk about that as well, maybe in a Q&A. That's a really good topic. How do you deal with the FBI? And we paid a ransom after hours. Uh, all, three of those, all three of those bullet points could be 45-minute presentations. They were really uh, good you know, kind of Harvard case study type of uh, processes that we went through. 10 o'clock Eastern, we received the first decryptor key. So we finished making payments at about seven o'clock at night. And I sat for three hours and waited, praying 
that they were going to send us a decryption key. Now, a lot of people say, don't pay the ransom. And this is kind of a religious discussion. As a CEO, you have to make a choice. And that choice is going to be what's best for the company and what's best for your fiduciary relationship to the board. How do you maintain that relationship? Uh, a lot of shareholders out there. Uh, so, so the CEO in this case, you know, he had to make a decision. $100 million potential extinction event or pay a ransom. Sometimes you don't have to, but in this case, you know, this, there's a lot of decision points that go into this. So for three hours, they sat across the office from me and said, Jeff, are they going to send a key? And I said, yes, they're going to send a key. How do you know? How can you be sure? I said, because if they don't send a key after we paid the money, nobody else is going to pay ransom. This is a customer service business. So at 10 o'clock at night, we received the first key and it didn't work. And I went back and I sent them a note, didn't work. They put me in touch with their help desk who sent me another key, which worked. I tested it out. Uh, by, by the morning of day five, we had critical operational systems back in, in, uh, in full operation. Uh, by day six, we were in full swing of restoration. Uh, by, by day seven, you know, all of the operations that we had decrypted were validated. We were able to recover about 90% of the, of the business systems. Uh, and, and between June and October, we put in architecture that wouldn't allow them to come back in and we continued with recovery. So it literally took about six months to get back to full operation after they had encrypted all of these things. Okay, so why? Number one, the code was polymorphic, meaning it looks different on every install. So traditional antivirus won't find polymorphic code. CrowdStrike at the time did not find polymorphic code. We had to reverse engineer the code to figure out what it looked like, derive a signature, and then start searching across the computer base to find the code that we were looking for and to figure out where it had been encrypted or where the encryption was, was, was happening. When you halt a computer, the code rebo reboots it. So it continues on. So there was no way to shut off a computer and then just hope that it wouldn't get uh, encrypted. The third point was it was, back, it, was, it, was, it was spread through the backup system. So the company had had best practice backups at the time. They had a Veritas system. And every two hours, the Veritas system would reach across these 65 locations and 7,500 employees and it would do an incremental backup. But every time the, the backup system touched one of these computers, it reinfected it with the ransomware. So this is a really big deal. Um, what we found, and the reason it took so long to, to recover operations is because the IT guys always think that they can fix this, but, but they don't really have the ability to do that, especially with this type of, of a complex installation, the reinfection processes, every time they change the data, uh, they lose the ability to decrypt. So, so here's how it started. Um, there was an authorized user in, in one of the facilities that got a pop-up on his screen that said, your computer's infected, let me scan it. And he signed in and he was compromised and the backups immediately spread, or the, the, the ransom immediately went into the backup system and they started going at it. Three key components to the way this operated. Number one, Drydex was used originally to, to get to capture credentials. So the, the first step in this thing when the guy jumped up on the, on the pop-up was they started looking for credentials. The second thing that they did is they started using those credentials on every remote desktop session that they could find in the company, which when they finally got in, allowed them to get into the backup system. And then they used PowerShell, which is a Windows tool for doing systems administration uh, to, to spread throughout the network. So three phases, Drydex, BitPaper, and PowerShell. The first thing that we did when we got, when we got back to operation was they had antivirus across the board, uh, but Antivirus, as I mentioned, was not enough to be able to stop this code because it was polymorphic. 
every installation looked different from the last and they were being reinfected every two hours. So the first thing that we did is we deployed a, a, a new endpoint protection system on every computer in the environment. The second thing that we did was we deployed a global password reset on every privileged account because now the, um, you know, the admin accounts are, creden are credentialed, single factor, passwords, usernames and passwords, and they were being used to go out and do the reinfections. The third thing which got us the most criticism was I immediately cut off the ability to access social media, cloud storage, cloud-based applications, those kinds of things, because we didn't want to infect other people. So we were basically quarantining ourselves and we turned off the ability to use USB devices across the board. So the idea was that we wanted to isolate each computer as its own island, put tools on it that would allow us to go hunt for the signature that we were able to derive that was being spread through the backup system, get it clean, and then bring it back to operation. And that's what we ended up having to do, almost one computer at a time over the several weeks that we were involved in the incident response. Once we got that baseline hardening complete, uh, they retained my company, Trusted Internet, as the security operations center. Um, so one of the things that we had to figure out was when you get hit by a ransomware and you pay the ransom, the expectation is that within 30 days, you're gonna get hit again. And so I planted a, a stake in the ground and said, listen, by 30 days, we're gonna have your environment hardened to the point where they're just gonna pass you by and go on to the next guy who's not hardened. So we immediately brought the security operations center online we had done the reverse engineering and the research, so we were able to add about 25,000 pieces of intelligence to the current defenses. And this was brand new information that we were able to derive from the code that we had taken off of the company's network. We put in some additional advanced security tools, and I'm gonna talk about what that infrastructure looks like in my very last slide, and I'll talk about the products that we use uh, and then we penetration tested those new controls. So for example, one of the leading vectors of ransomware is through email. So we immediately put in hardening controls on the email system, and then we penetra penetration tested those, those, those controls using a third party who had no idea what had happened to see if they could hack through our system. We had put in proxies for remote desktop applications. So remote desktop is used by typically administrators who wanna be able to log into their desktop at work to be able to, to do different things. So they log into their desktop at work, they call it remote desktop. We wanted to block that and make it so that somebody had to come through, authenticate with a, with a token or a re revolving password before they got in and protect that remote desktop session. Uh, so we, we took them off the internet and then we, t we pen tested those to find out if the controls that we had put in were able to be, uh, were able to be uh, shown as secure. So here's the challenge, right? So seconds count. In this case, it was within five minutes they detected what was going on. But the IT team thought that they could take care of, them, take care of it themselves and they were trying to mess with the data um, you know, change things, uh, see if they could restore it themselves. But every, try, every time they tried to do that, they changed the data structure that was originally encrypted, and then they weren't able to get that data back. Uh, so those were, that was like the 10% that was lost. Number two, um, this can happen to anyone. There's not a computer out there that doesn't have a hole somewhere. And, and the idea that, you know, if you are a mid-sized company and you're impervious to this, um, don't believe that. This is not just a lottery where you're going to go out and somebody's going to say, I caught you surfing porn, send me $300, or I'm going to tell everyone. This was a targeted event. And in a targeted event of a mid-sized company where they think you can pay a million dollars in ransom, they're going to look for the right opening in, and they did. Be ready. So if you don't have people that are watching your network, 24 seven for these types of things the, you know, you could buy the best, the best firewalls and the best intrusion prevention and all those kinds of things, but their, their Intel is only good to the last load and they're trying to protect everyone, not just you. 
And so you really have to have somebody that's watching your network all the time, fending off that last five or 10%. And then the last is they won't be stopped, right? These attacks will not be stopped, but they can be managed if you're prepared for them. So why is four days important? Four days was the amount of time that it took the IT team to try to fix it on, the own, on their own. Before the CEO had really known what was going on, before the CEO had told the board, and before the CEO really understood that he was in the middle of a ransomware event, all he knew was that the systems were down. And then the last part of this is at a cost of about $25 million a day in, in losses, um, $700,000 in $4 million in remediation. So this went on for four days. What I found out later when I was doing some work for another company is they had hired a retired FBI agent who told me that he was out of, I forget which office, but there were two offices that were battling back and forth between the FBI as to who was going to take this case. And they split it. One was going to handle incident response. The other was going to handle the breach of fiduciary case that they were going to bring against the CEO for not telling the board for four days. And so there's a whole lot of things that are happening all at the same time, but four days was a critical time. So this is, I kind of joke about this, right? Most people think that this is what their IT looks like. As long as it's running and I'm making money, we're good. Uh, but, but in truth, this is what your IT looks like. And, and every door has something different behind it. And, and so you kind of have to think about the fact that, you know, for every new cloud application, for every new vendor that you bring on, for every new cell phone that you add to your network, you're adding another layer of heterogeneous complexity to your IT environment. And that expands something that we call the digital footprint. Because you're adding these things on without doing the security work to make sure that that new SaaS environment in your Amazon cloud or whoever it is you're using has got the security on the back end. You're basically introducing what I believe is an insecure environment into your own now secure environment, maybe. But, but the bottom line is there are a lot of things happening in the back end. So I want you to just consider a couple of thoughts. Number one, right now with COVID, and this is even before, but right now with COVID, the first few weeks of COVID for us, we were building VPN solutions in Amazon Cloud to be able to you know, pull 4,000 employees in and then pipe them back to their, to their home offices so that they could work. But what's happening right now is you've got people who are working from home and fast internet is really cheap. And most of these people have, you know, 300 megs of internet at least. I've got, you know, several with a gig. And, uh, and, and your employees today who are working from home are probably working from home without firewalls and without up-to-date up to antivirus and a lot of the things that you would require inside the company. And so what you really have to think about is how do you extend the fabric of your internal security environment now out to a remote worker's home. And so that's the reason that I, I, I talk about this a little bit. This is kind of a big deal now because we've gone from installing VPNs to doing incident response because now the bad guys have had a little time to breathe. We're seeing the complexity increase going after home users just like they were going after the companies, but with a lot less effort because they have fast internet and no protections. In fact, these are typical instructions that you see for home users. Uh, this is obviously Netgear. This is what you'll find in almost any home. Maybe a more complex home, you'll find ring devices or a Wink controller or some kind of a media Sonos, but, but nowhere in this is there protection. All, all it says is plug your computer into the modem and plug your modem into your, your, your cable or DSL modem. And that's it. That's what gets you into trouble. And so this is a thing that I've been talking about for a lot, you know, a lot of different industries. The interconnectedness is huge. I don't have to tell you that. You're using cloud, you're using virtualization. Those things are connecting to things that you've never even thought about, but you now have built in trust relationships because 
when you go to uh, your, I don't know, your ERP system, your ERP system is connecting to something that's going to reach out and order a part when you take something off the shelf. And you have no idea how that supplier is connecting into you. And now everybody's doing it from home. Okay, a couple of targets. Mobiles. Mobiles are computers. That's all there is to it. So one of the things that we see all the time now that we don't really have a good answer for is that mobiles are being used for crypto mining. But we're also now starting to see remote access trojans get pushed to, to telephones, which give people the ability who are doing work off their phones to be monitored, to use that for tunnels into other things, and to attack other people. Executives. Executives get hacked at home just like they get hacked in the office. No question about it. Every single time, no doubt. This, this thing that I put up in the middle, we responded to the number two in a company out in California last year, and she had called us and said, Jeff, somebody stole my telephone number. I said, well, okay, how do you know? Because I called Verizon and they have no record of me. And so they had ported her telephone number over to Google, and then they used that telephone number to call the banks and change the PIN for her bank account. So they had stolen $82,000 out of her personal bank account in the course of about three weeks time. She actually wrote a blog and a vlog about what we did. It's called The Fiscal Feminist. You can go look it up. She tells a story about how we came in and we were able to, to take care of her. But we literally had to go to her house, rebuild her entire in-home network, put firewalls in place, what had happened was somebody had broken into her Netgear through that architecture that I just showed you. They had this Netgear wireless modem, this Wi-Fi wi -Fi router, and they turned it into a keystroke logger. And they used it to capture all of her usernames and passwords when she was logging into her bank accounts and her email and her work and all of these other things. This is a big deal. We spent two days with her just calling the banks and getting all of these things fixed. Uh, the unsuspecting. Look, kids are tough. Everybody likes to game. Most of them like to use Steam. Uh, you just don't know what your kids are into. You've got to have something that you can put on their systems to pay attention to. Cloud and SaaS. We just talked about this. This is one of the biggest vectors for you being able to get infected. So when you go out and you do a review of, of one of your third-party IT providers, your CIO, your chief information security officer, the first thing that they should be asking is, let me see your SaaS 70. Let me see your SSAE 16. These are the certifications for how the data center is protecting your stuff. The next question is, okay, if I'm gonna use your application, show me the application audit and, and how old is it? And did you pass? You'll wanna see those kinds of things. Okay, I saved the best for last. In 100% of the places where we install and monitor uh, cybersecurity, the first thing that we find hacked is the physical security systems. Because they also have instructions that say, plug this into your cable modem. Most of the physical security guys don't understand that the network video recorders and the video, or the video systems themselves, the cameras, ha have back doors built into them. And they can't really be upgraded. So you have to figure out how to protect that because this is a 100% high risk place. And if somebody really wanted to drop malware, ransomware in your environment, this is a super easy place to do it. So this is a brand new map. I just pulled this off of a site called Shodan. You can go and plug your company name into Shodan or your domain, and it'll tell you if you're leaking. Uh, but the red dots are places around the world with Telnet openings. Telnet is a very old protocol, and it allows you to communicate to another computer over command line without encryption and just a username and password. But take a look at the numbers of, of Telnet sessions that are up here. You know, 160,000 computers plus or minus around the world today have open Telnet connections. And that's just lazy, right? So this is only one protocol out of about 100,000 protocols that I could test for that would tell me whether or not a computer has a leak somewhere in the world, around the world. Okay, this is the last slide. And this is the architecture that we, that we recommend, baseline architecture. We use this across the board. It's, it's meant to be a common sense approach. 
to security, not a compliance approach to security, but it turns out that it actually satisfies a lot of the compliance requirements for the things that you'll have to, you'll have to deal with. In the US, it's HIPAA, CMMC for government defense contractors, but, but this is gonna, gonna do it for you. Here's the way it works. Um, every computer gets two pieces of software. One is a, an antivirus system that allows your security operations people or mine, whoever you use, to be able to manage your uh, antivirus remotely. So not only does it give us the ability to do antivirus, but also we do 24 seven scanning for vulnerabilities on the system that we can push a button and update for immediately. So we have vulnerability scanning, we can do remote troubleshooting, it has a VPN client in it. And worst case scenario is we can quarantine the box so that only we can talk to it. And then we'll call you and say, hey, so this is one of those things that's required. Number two on every endpoint is something that we call anti-evasion. Anti-evasion basically says, if anything tries to, anti to evade antivirus, kill it automatically, don't ask. So what this does for us is it builds a forensic trail so that we can log into the computer, find out what had happened, see the evidence chain, figure out what was going on, create a signature, and then we can go back through our tools and try to fix it all remotely. Number two, just up the stack. Right here, we put a next generation firewall or a stack of security tools that give us that same capability. But in small and medium sized companies, most of these things come in one box now. You don't have to go out and buy a whole lot of, a whole lot of hardware and software. So what this does, is it gives us the ability to do on the fly intrusion prevention. If we see an attack coming in, we automatically block it. If we see something inside your computer, your environment that's trying to reach out to somebody that's known bad, we automatically block it. It gives us the ability to look at your DNS queries. DNS is like the telephone book for the internet. I wanna know Jeff Stutzman, Jeff Stutzman, here's the name, his phone number 603-930-2222. You do the same thing with computers. You want to go to Google. Google's address is 8.8.8.8. .8 there it is. And so this DNS translates one to the other back and forth. And what this does for us is we know many of the addresses that are bad. So if you go out and you look for XYZ123, and we know that XYZ123 is hosting malware, and it looks for that address, we just automatically deny you the ability to go to XYZ123. And so that's a really powerful tool because what we don't wanna do is to start telling you, you can go to this website, but you can't go to that. We don't wanna filter your websites. We wanna look at the, at the lookups for where it's going because they change so quickly. The next thing, if you have passwords in your environment, get rid of them. This is a no brainer, low cost, high payoff. It's going to save you. It's so easy now, almost everybody has two-factor authentication built in. The way we do it is I say, if I log into a system with a user and password, I wanna get something on my cell phone that gives me a code to plug in. That's the way I like to work. That's the way that we install. We also have things that you can push. Next thing, every traveler gets a, gets a virtual private network. So an encrypted tunnel back to their home firewall so that no matter where they are in the world, they're being protected just like they're sitting in the office. We try to make it so the VPNs are on automatically, but we want these things to come back to the home firewall so that you're protected anywhere in the world, just like you're sitting in the office. If you're going to a high risk place, we typically will give you a dirty laptop and a burner phone. Burner phones go out with no usernames and passwords, Everything happens through encrypted tunnels. Everything is on VOIP so that we can monitor you for intrusion. And then when you get back, you can either toss them away in the airport or you can bring them back for forensics, but everybody goes on a VPN. And then of course, everything is monitored 24 seven. All right, so I would tell you the architecture that we use without telling you the products that we use. And you can buy these yourself if you're using these, we like to lead every engagement with a product by Fortinet. Fortinet is an expert level tool. It's not something that you just go and buy and drop in. 
you're, 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 it's like you're jumping into a Ferrari and you're putting the pedal down and you're going into first, second, and third gear within the first three seconds. So be prepared. Fortinet gives us a lot of knobs to push, buttons to push, levers we can pull in times of crisis so that we can actually fight your network. Your SOC team has the ability to do that too. So we like to use Fortinet products for those kinds of things. If you don't have that heavy skill set, then you can use a Sophos product or a Cisco Meraki product if you're in a lower risk environment. We deploy any of those and we'll monitor them. So, um, so those are the products that we use. That's the architecture and you've heard the story. So now you know the story. This is how you prevent it. And questions? Before questions, Jeff, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody. Uh, that, that was a fantastic presentation. I think everybody needs to take at least 30 seconds to recover uh, from what you yeah. told us. Uh, I wouldn't use the word uh, scared us, but uh, certainly got our attention. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, uh, to have you on this call is just fantastic, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions. If, if people have questions or when you have questions, you can put them in the chat box uh, or you can hit the, you know, raise hand button and, uh, you know, we'll watch for those. Uh, and when you're called on for your question, if you could just give us a, a brief, quick, you know, 15 second self intro, uh, that would be fantastic as well, just so we know uh, who's asking the question. Um, but uh, but thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, and uh, you know I, I have I have a quick question for you. While we wait for some others to pile in, and that is, um, you know, we talk about uh, you know COVID really uh, you know really exacerbating the situation here. A lot of people working from home. You talked about that, but you know how much how much has uh, has this problem increased uh, you know since since COVID nineteen. So I, it's funny you asked that. I had to quote that this morning. We've had about a six x increase in in incident response calls in the last in the last two or three weeks. Six about six hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, phenomenal. And 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 in fact, um, my team and I have been driving to locations around around the country to go and do responses because nobody wants to go through an airport. So the the airplanes are clean, the air is clean, it's, you know, that's not, it's not recycled air, it comes off the engine, right, for positive pressure, but yep. there's no way that you're going to sanitize an, you know, entire airport. So actually next week, I'm, I am driving to Florida to do an incident response in a home. So yeah, about six yeah. hours. Driving, avoiding the airports, eh? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, um, thank you for that uh, response. We've got two questions uh, in the chat box, but I, I'm going to call on the person that has them. And Paul Gibson, I see you have a question. And then Carmen, uh, we'll go to you. But Paul, do you want to ask the first question? Of yeah, Jeff? thanks. And, uh, you know, I'm just coming down off the terror right here. But just <laughs> when we're looking at, uh, because I'm thinking a lot about the, the, what you said about all the people out uh, in the homes, and we're not going to get them back anytime soon. In fact, many of them wanted to stay there. It, what should we be looking for in the credentialing around a firm that says, yeah, I can go out to your, your uh, employees' homes and put a firewall in behind the, uh, their equipment and make sure that, you know, what are we looking for? Because there's going to be a lot of firms out there might dial yours, but what else, is, uh, what else is, should we be looking for? Yeah, look, no, that, that's a great question, right? So we, we actually had started out by being retained by one of the banks in New York, and we've been, we've been getting deployed to their high net worth families, right, CEOs and and, and old money types of folks. And there are a couple of questions that we always get. Number one, uh, they wanna know that they, they trust the people that are gonna, they're sending into the home. I mean, that's a really big deal, right? So I'm gonna go into somebody's home. That's an invasion of their privacy and they wanna be able to be sure that when I deploy tools, I'm not reading their email. You know, I'm not watching what they surf. We don't really care, but they don't know that. And so there's a trust issue. Um, number two, um, Make sure that whoever you send in is fully certified. I require the people that we put in to have at least a chief information or a certified information system security professional cert, CISSP. There are several good ones out there, but if I'm going to send somebody out in a home, my insurance requires that I have somebody certified with the demonstrated experience to be able to go into the home. The other part is when you go into a home. Um, 
it's very different than going into an office. If I, I don't know where you work, but if I were to come into your office, I probably would bring two or three people so that I was sure that I could cover the skill sets that you needed. But when you go into a home, that's intimidating, right? So, the, so the, the question really is, do do you have people that you can put in front of, uh, in front of an employee that they're going to feel comfortable working with? They're not going to be threatened by, and who has the ability to actually do the work? Those are the things that I that I look for. Yeah, very good. Thanks for that, Jeff. And and Carmen, uh, uh, just uh, a, a question uh, from you, and maybe you could just give a quick self intro, and and then going to call on you, Dave Hardy, for your question. Okay, so Carmen, over to you. Thanks very much, um, Carmen Singh from uh, United Families. I am the general manager for United. Um, just to clarify, you had mentioned that it's best to have. Uh, forced VPN to ensure your employees are always VPNing into your, your system. Our systems, a lot of our applications are web-based. Do you suggest that we make it mandatory for them to VPN in before they even access those web-based or intranet systems? I do. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and so, the, but this is a great point, right? So there's a couple of ways that you can approach VPN. You can approach it where you're going to have it log in from the minute that you connect. So you could use like a Cisco AnyConnect. Mm -hmm. If you've got a Cisco backend or the Forti client, we'll do it. <clears throat> so we like to have that from the minute the computer comes on, automatically connect into your VPN, back to your firewalls in the office, and then go out to your SaaS because it's going to operate just like you're sitting in the office, right? Otherwise, you're kind of taking a chance that you know, okay. maybe they're going to bring an infection or, right? right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. No, very good. Thank, thank you. And, and, and Dave, uh, uh, your question, and then, and then we're going to go to Zane Yassi. So, but first, uh, Dave, just a quick self-intro and then uh, your question. Yeah, Dave Hardy. I'm uh, president of Hardy Stevenson Associates Limited. We're a planning, um, environmental planning engineering firm. We have firms working for us across North America. Um, my question is, generally, it's a more general question. Uh, where are the com countries or who are the actors that are who kind of most commonly um, the problem or the source of, of ransomware? Ah, okay, so there's a couple of places. Um, and and this, is, this is a non-attrib discussion, if you wouldn't mind, but Russia does it for money. China does it because they're usually, the pipes are being used by other countries. So when you hear about Chinese hacking, that's usually about espionage and intellectual property, but there are really open connections that are coming out of China that we see other actors do it. A um, couple of years ago, you probably had heard about the Sony breach, the ransomware that happened there. That was North Korean actors, a group called Lazarus. And so it was said that Lazarus was a group of people that had been deployed out by the, by the regime, and they were told, don't come home unless you've earned at least $100 million per person or we're going to kill your families. This was a, this was a big deal. And, and the sourcing was, was actually pretty good on that. So you've got government-sponsored ransomware actors that are out there doing targeted events for the money, for places that have to have money. So Iran was doing it for the longest time. We've seen a little bit out of South America, but, the, but Brazil is pretty good on tightening the networks down. But, but it's, it's the common places that you've heard about before. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I know, that wasn't a, I know that wasn't a great answer, but it's actually true. So, sorry, Dave. It, it's the answer, right? Uh, Zane, uh, Zane, over to you, quick intro, and then, uh, and then Lou, we're gonna come to you for your question too, okay? So, Zane? Hi, Jeff, uh, Zane here, Tigris Engineering. Uh, how vulnerable our phones are, uh, and do we need to download an antivirus on our phones? Yeah, so, I run a Sophos product on my Android phone just to be safe, but the phones are, our computers, and there's a lot of code out there for iOS and for Android phones. And so the answer is yes. How, however, um, I think you could chase your tail on this too, right? So you're, you're gonna come to a point where you're, where you're, you're gonna have reduced returns as a result of the, of the increased you know, spend. So um, I use a Sophos product, it works really well. It scans every application on my phone routinely gives me a pop-up that tells me it's okay. It looks at the data coming in and out. I, I like it a lot, it's what I recommend. Um, there are other things that you could do on the phones as well. They have these, uh, they have like remote desktop management things that you can use on computers, except now you can use them on your 
on your phones are called MDM, uh, mobile device managers. And those things are really good too for centralized management. But if you don't have somebody that's keeping up on it routinely, then it just becomes a hole into your computer, into your phone. And so now it leaves your phone open for, for attack if that, if that MDM solution isn't managed actively and monitored routinely. So, so the answer is yes, inexpensive, good Sophos product. I don't sell Sophos, go buy it, but you'll like it. And then, um, uh, you know, think about that MDM solution for, for a company that has a full on security operations center. That's a really good way to go. Yeah, very good. Uh, and uh, just after Lou's question, we're gonna go, gonna go to you, Stuart, uh, for your question, and then we're probably gonna have to wrap up. But Lou, over to you for your question of Jeff. Thank you. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Jeff. My question relates to a comment you made earlier, and that was um, when the solution was presented, the FBI was approached and engaged in the process. So my question is, to what extent do uh, do you get um, police departments and and the like involved when you uh, when there is a, a hacking of this? Type? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, local police, it's always good. I mean, it's always good to do a report. In, in our situation, and the way that I typically go about it is, um, um, I like to give the CEO three choices, and so I gave the CEO three choices, and we discussed which one he was going to use, which ended up being paying the ransom. And at that point, we brought in external counsel so that everything was protected by attorney-client privilege. And we called the FBI and said, here's what's going on, and, and this is our plan. And they went, okay. And they were okay with that. And so the, the concern was when I showed up that typically you have 72 hours before the encryption key gets, gets erased. And we were up against the clock and what we didn't want to have was law enforcement come in, try to do their own investigation, delaying the fact that you're going to have to pay a ransom and potentially losing the encryption key and have the company go bankrupt. So, so we, did, we gave them a notification and we said, we're going to get back to you with our course of action. We had the discussion, we went back and everything was good. That's the way that I like to handle law enforcement in general. The local PDs, some of them have the ability to do forensics. Most of them do forensics on things like child pornography cases. But, but in, you know, in, like in New Hampshire, they send it to the FBI anyway. So we like, to, we like to be informed when we're talking to them, have a plan, make them confident that we, can, that we can work through it. And they are typically pretty appreciative of that. After the dust settled, they called us up and said, can you share the malware? We said, absolutely. So we brought them up on a call, all again under attorney-client privilege, which is very important. And we were able to give them a full debrief. You know, all of the questions that they had, we were able to answer. We talked about reversing the code, how it happened. They had lessons learned then that they could spread, through, spread throughout their own networks. It was a really good relationship. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart Wright, uh, I think the last question is going to go to you. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up here in a few minutes, but uh, Stuart, over to you for your question to Jeff. Sure, I've got two brief questions. Brief question. you, but we... Yeah, can you hear me now, Jeff? Yes, sir. Sure, it's brilliant. Uh, first question, uh, excellent debrief, by the way, really, really impressive. Wanted to ask you, the polymorphic engine, uh, did you identify a mutation engine, which was deterring your ability to respond and recover? Uh, and second aspect to it, would AI have detected it? Um, second question, the four days it took for the C-level to be made aware and take appropriate measures in response and bring yourself and your team in, uh, what measures could other C-level entities, and I lead cybersecurity here in Ontario, all the CISOs and CEOs report to me relating to their cyber resiliency and posture, what measures could we convey to them to take different steps to, res to improve that response and recovery timeline. I'm gonna go back on video. So, sure. okay, number one, uh, AI was used and did not detect it, right? So we brought in, we brought in CrowdStrike, it's an AI driven engine. Mm -hmm. It did not detect it largely because, um, you know, there's a variable in there that just wasn't known. So the machines never really had the ability to learn on that variable, mm -hmm. right? Which is critically important. Um, now they could probably, but at the mm -hmm. time they, they could not. Um, 
Was there a mutation? No, it wasn't. It was just built into the code. So we weren't seeing it mutate, but what was happening is we would see a box that was overwritten and then it would be overwritten again. And then again, every two hours, it was being re-encrypted. So that was one of the challenges that we, we had. What we ended up having to do was to reverse engineer the code. We found out that there was a random string that was appended in the middle of the file name. Not typ typically, it's the file name itself is completely randomized. But what they did is they used the username and a little random bit in that between the extension on the file. And then it was dropped into a roaming profile on the, on the, the, the backup system. And so the backup system has no business having a roaming profile, right? As you know. And so that was the tell for the code. And that's how we eventually found it. Very so then we, we knew that yeah. that's where it was coming from. Yeah. Okay. So the last part of that question, and I think probably the most critically important part of this question is we now with this client run routine tabletops, not just no before emails that go out, right? We actually get the IT team together and we, and we throw a card on the table and say, it could be a random card. This is what it is. What are we going to do? And we have to just kind of walk through it. It doesn't have to be, you know, a $50,000 big four type of a deal. It just has to be, okay, how are you going to make payroll? I mean, these were the things that we had to think about. It wasn't which systems are going to be restored first. It was how do I make payroll? How do I collect money because I have bills? And, and, and out of the, you know, out, I mean, this was a live exercise. I had these guys in the room for 14 hours and, and it came back to, we're going to have to go back to a paper ledger for the foreseeable future. So they take in money by getting a check, putting it into their accounts receivable, to, you know, taking the check, stamping it and going to the bank. Well, they ended up having to revert to legal pad for a couple of days. And so what can be done about it is a playbook upfront about what would happen if your computers went away. And whether that's for a day or four months, you don't know. So by far, that's the most valuable thing that, that this company could have done, which probably would have cost them a couple of hours of executive time. And that's it. An ounce now, of prevention. Great. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Just, just practice. Yeah. Just practice. Thank you very much. Great question, Stuart. And thanks, uh, Jeff, for the response. We are